So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to SEPS event uh, jointly with the C4U project on a very topical issue today on carbon capture and storage. Uh, so we are all waiting for the new strategy to be released in upcoming weeks, I would say. And today we felt it's very interesting, urgent and important to get into the discussion on societal trust and the role of the society in this discussion on broad industrial decarbonization and carbon capture and storage in particular. And I would like to welcome you to our event, uh, which is conducted under the C4U Horizon Europe project funded by the European Union. Is societal trust the missing link for a policy and business case for carbon capture and storage in a net zero transition? And we have today distinguished panelists, distinguished speakers. Uh, we are looking forward for very interesting discussion. And I would like to introduce also the moderator of today's event, Moises Kovarubias, my dear colleague at C4U project. Uh, he is a researcher at Radboud University uh, Netherlands, and he's also a research fellow in Earth System Governance Project Network. So, Moises, I pass the floor to you, but I need to remind you that this event is on record, and uh, later it will be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, it will last for about 90 minutes, and uh, we welcome you to ask questions, and uh, we plan to have a dedicated Q&A session uh, in the end of the event. So, Moises, the floor is yours, and I think uh, we welcome the first uh, uh, discussants, first speakers. Thank you very much, Irina. Welcome to everyone. So, we have the honor to have uh, two persons that are very well known in the scene of CCS and CCU. So, without longer introductions, we have Professor Elaine de Koning working at Radar University, but also the Technical University of Eindhoven, working for over 20 years on CCS and CCU, and being involved in uh, several reports on the IPCC. Please. <laughs> and a, a, a genius of the industry came along to these discussions, Paul Colpen, working at Sverim, and he is very uh, knowledgeable about a uh, CCUS demonstration uh, for the industry. We'll have a very engaging uh, discussion about it. But without uh, more introduction, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Moises. And uh, thank you all for being uh, here. Really uh, lovely to have this event. Um, so indeed, with here with Paul and me, you're sort of having the In the Sea for You project the technology guy and the social science societal girl. <laughs> um, and uh, with big teams behind us uh, who, who are uh, helping us a lot with, uh, with the work. So rather than having two, you know, 10-minute uh, presentations, we thought we could stage a conversation between society and technology. You know, so I will ask uh, Paul, questions that society may have, and Paul will ask me questions from, you know, industry technology about, you know, society. So that's how we, uh, uh, we, we're hoping to do it here. We'll see how that, uh, that works and whether you find that uh, maybe a bit, little bit more enjoyable and lively than a, a, a sending uh, um, presentation. So, yeah, the first question uh, uh, to Paul is, um, so, where do you work and uh, what, do you, what do you do and why are you involved in this uh, C4U project? That's the kind of technology guy I am. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, uh, I work at Sverim. Um, Sverim is an institute that uh, works a lot within the metallurgy industry and we do large-scale demonstrations of new technology for uh, that industry, mostly for the iron and steel. And so we've got a lot of large-scale equipment, although not industrial-scale uh, equipment, but large-scale, much bigger than you'd see in a university. And we do the due diligence that industry requires before they go to implementing new types of technology. So. You know, we have 
Uh, I think this is one of the major things we have. This is just a pipeline. You say, what's special about a pipeline? This pipeline is bringing gas from a real glass blast furnace, so the primary production route for iron and steel to our facilities. So it's, um, it's, it's bringing in up to 2,000 normal cubic meters an hour. If you wonder what that is, that's a lot. In, that's about a thousand times bigger than most universities will have for their biggest piece of equipment. Um, we do a lot of work. We have a lot of reactors. This is uh, one of the main reactors we have. This is a 10 meter tall reactor. This is part of the CFU project for capturing CO2. So mixed gases go into this reactor and only uh, and CO2 stays behind and it's regenerated later. If we want to do any kind of CCUS, then you have to have CO2 that's separated. This is an example of a balloon full of CO2 that's been captured from an industrial process. You also see the, uh, the typical kind of weather we have in northern Sweden. Three weeks ago, it was minus 38. Um, and so if technology works in Sverim and works outside, it can work almost anywhere because uh, it has to not freeze. And um, this is an electrolyzer. So, um, so we're not only covering CO2 infrastructure or CO2 capture, but also how you can integrate hydrogen into that. Because it's, it's not necessarily a question of, do you only go for CCS? Do you only go for hydrogen? But there's um, a middle ground where you can find some some overlap between the two. So these are the typical kind of processes that we're into. Here in the middle, you see this is a universal converter, which is part of the electric arc furnace. So if you think of new steel making uh, for the future, you're going to have this type of equipment there. This is only 10 tons of material. Typically, in uh, an industrial process, you'll have up to about 250 tons of material. But at the 10 ton scale, you really know what it's going to cost when you get to the 250 ton scale. Um, so here's our site, northern Sweden, and we're actually close to two really important parts of the value chain going forward in CCS, and that's or decarbonisation. This is the steel plant, two and a half million tonnes a year, and this is hybrid. You might have heard of it. They got quite a bit of money from the Innovation Fund for hydrogen-based steel making. Hydrogen-based steel making doesn't mean there's no carbon in there. But within the C4U project, we also have a cluster. Um, not this cluster, but another cluster that's um, based around the places that some, some of the ArcelorMittal um, factories are in Europe. So there's... Um, we have Spain with the ArcelorMittal gas lab taking part, and we also have Belgium, uh, and Marianne's here from uh, ArcelorMittal Belgium. And they are part of a cluster of industries um, around the North Sea port. And um, whereas I tend to sometimes think about only my little island, my, my iron and steel island, there's more than that. Of course, there's a bigger cluster. And maybe in terms of social things, it's um, what kind of uh, cluster have we got within the C4U project? And could you explain that to me, why I have to think about other people than just iron and steel? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Next slide. Shall I uh, take the uh, clicker? Yeah, thanks. So yeah, in the uh, C4U project, good question, Paul. In the C4U <laughs> project, we are focusing on a, on a cluster called the North Sea Port Area, which is a transboundary industrial cluster uh, spanning uh, the southwest of the Netherlands, the province of Zeeland, uh, and uh, uh, northwestern uh, um, Belgium in uh, west, uh, East Flanders, actually. Um, and here you see um, a map of the, the uh, Wester Skeld um, uh, with, with Flissingen and uh, Terneuze, and then on the left side you see what industries there are along um, the, the, the canal that are going into Belgium, including uh, a large steel plant by Arcelor uh, Mittal and Marianne will probably uh, tell us more about that one. So this is a cluster with chemical industry and steel industry, with a refinery, uh, a nuclear power plant, um, a gas-fired power plant, etc. Et so it's 
and it's it's all uh, sort of dependent on each other. They exchange the feedstocks. Um, they they rely on the same energy. Um, there there is some level of integration, even though it's not the most integrated cluster uh, uh, around. Um, the North Sea Board is looking into uh, um, a, a strategy to decarbonize completely towards 2050, to be climate neutral to that, uh, towards uh, that year. Uh, of course, in the ETS, they may even need to hurry even more, um, because already in 2040, we may be looking at uh, no uh, credits being handed out uh, or for sale anymore um, and, uh, and deep, deep reductions. So uh, it's urgent to reduce emissions deeply and uh, CO2 capture and storage and CO2 capture and utilization is one of the, are some of the technologies that the industries are, are obviously uh, looking at. Now work done by, um, so what we are curious about is how, how, how does it, what actually affects the, uh, the, the prospects for climate neutrality and the possibilities for decarbonization of this whole cluster. Uh, what does that depend on? And then we're looking at uh, the m both the governments in Flanders and, and Belgium and those in the Netherlands, in Zeeland, uh, looking at municipalities that have an, uh, a, a say in this, local communities, national governments in two countries and their respective policies and subsidy regimes, of course, EU-level uh, policies. We're looking at different industries with different characteristics with headquarters all over the world. So it's quite a complex uh, playing field. Um, and uh, Floris here and, and Vincent, uh, conducted an, uh, a, a workshop to sort of map what is a, what actually determines from a dynamic perspective. So, what are the dependencies within this system that determine whether this uh, climate neutrality is uh, is possible? And if you, the method is basically that you put a, a number of stakeholders together in a room and on the spot build a system dynamics uh, model together with, and Vincent is really skilled at, at sort of leading workshops like that. It's really a special, a special thing to, uh, to experience. Now, what you get out of that is, uh, you know, we tend to think, okay, we, uh, we just need an economic incentive to make this happen, right? Because that's what often governments and industry are, are, are telling us. And that's, uh, if you believe that, you know, the ETS should actually be enough. Um, but if we um, do an exercise like this, and I'm sorry that here the, the, um, the words are mostly in Dutch, then you're looking at a way more complicated uh, um, uh, picture. You're looking at all kinds of dependencies uh, between different technologies, between different stakeholders, through different political processes, and um, et cetera. And this is sort of an intermediate result, so don't treat this as the, as the final one. Um, but just as an illustration of what is uh, what what is sort of um, what you get out of a, a group model building like this. Now, clearly, it is. I hope I make clear that it's more complicated, and that's also a social uh, aspect play a role in that because local support of municipalities of people they 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 matter in this whole process. That's also that's basically what the participants found out. Right? It's not uh, something that we told them, but it's really what came out of their uh, of this group model building session. So, uh, Paul, then the question to you is, um, there's one loop here that, uh, that relates more to CCS and, and, and C4U. And uh, now that we have, you know, good prospects for hydrogen-based uh, steel making, also in, in hybrid, do we actually still need CCS uh, in, uh, in, in the steel industry, or can we just do without it? Fantastic question. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we just saw that there's a very big uh, interaction model in terms of uh, 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 stakeholders, but even within one sector like the steel sector, there's a very large value chain. And I've tried to simplify it here to show you what the value chain looks like today. We've got, oh, let's uh, go from here. We've got traditional steel making which is uh, blast furnace, um, uh, BOF steel making, producing steel to the primary products, and we've got secondary steel making using the electric arc furnace. So in Europe today, 60% of our steel is, is primary steel and 40% is a recycled steel, secondary steel. And they're going to products and uh, the products are made, they reach the end of life, and some of that end-of-life material goes back into the steel process, the primary steel making. 
some of it into the secondary steel making. And uh, there's also something called premium scrap. So when you're making a car, you cut out a nice piece of steel, the right size to mold it into the panel, and you've got some steel left over. And that's going to the electric arc furnace owners, mostly. Why? Because it's just easier for them to remelt it, because then you don't have to bother too much about uh, mixing it into the traditional primary steel making. And there's other bits going in as well. For example, the electric arc steel makers from that today, they can't make steel without having extra materials coming in, extra fresh iron. Why is that? It's because this scrap is dirty. It's got all kinds of stuff in it that you don't want in steel. The major one for most steel makers is copper. You know, all these very nice materials that just a little bit of copper in it and it gets into the, uh, the scrap and it ends up in the steel. And the steel with copper in it is not good steel. So they have to freshen it up with new iron. So even the secondary steel makers need fresh steel to produce. And there's other materials going in like alloys. Alloys tend to have way higher carbon footprints than the primary steel makers. Nickel, typically 60 tons of CO2 per ton of nickel, depending on the type of ore you come from. Vanadium, similar. Yeah. It depends which ore you come from. If you have the, the really expensive ore, you can get down to 12 tons. So what are we thinking about if we're going to switch to hydrogen-based steel making? So we change this left side of the process. Um, we've got a reduction shaft, and then we've got something we already recognize. We've got an electric arc furnace as well, which is the same as here. So what's going to change really in this system? The premium scrap, it's no longer going to go to the secondary steel makers. It's going to go to the primary steel makers because they have a reason to melt it again. So the secondary steel makers, who make all the interesting types of steel, sorry, Arcelor, um, <laughs> uh, all the high value types of steel, like ball bearings or very specialist steels, um, yeah, well, they haven't got any fresh steel anymore. So what are they going to do? Um, they still need fresh iron. So, And it's not as if they haven't got a carbon footprint. Electric arc furnace sounds like it's electrically driven, which it is, but it still has quite a big CO2 footprint. Much smaller than traditional steel making, but it's not that if the traditional steel makers switch to electric arc furnace, they won't have a CO2 footprint anymore. And the alloying elements are in there as well. So if we look at European steel making, 1.6 to 2 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of steel from primary, 0.2 to 0.4, substantially lower, but it's not zero, from EAS. 60% steel production on the left-hand side, 40% on the right-hand side. So 90% of the emissions do come from the primary steel making and 10% from the pr secondary steel making. What happens if we shift? Well, if the electric arc furnace makers really make a good go of it to reduce their emissions, maybe they're down to 0 0.1, 0 0.2. But that still means with this 60-40 split, the overall emission reduction is only in the range of 75 if we can't really improve the electric arc furnace steel making anymore, and 90% if the electric arc furnace makers hit all of their targets. So it's still a substantial amount of CO2, which is why I would say CCS is going to be important in the future also for uh, European steel making, even if we can make a transition to um, hydrogen-based steel making. But there's one more thing, which is this. This is a supp supply chain for iron ore around the world. As you can see, there's quite a lot of import of iron ore into Europe. But there's all kinds of different qualities of iron ore. And there's only a certain amount of iron ore that is 
um, suitable for using hydrogen. And by 2050, the demand for that type of iron ore will be double the production capacity. If we um, improve our uh, production facilities that we have and open up lots more mines, then we can get to maybe double by 2050. So there's still going to be a need also, even within Europe, for CCS um, implementations around use of uh, traditional primary st uh, steel makers. And of course, it's going to be a decision that every steel maker themselves make in terms of how much hydrogen am I going to use, how much electricity, how much carbon with CCS, how much carbon with CCUS. But, you know, I hope, Helene, uh, with this diatribe, I've uh, persuaded you that we can't get away from using carbon capture within the steel industry. And it's just part of the, um, the ecosystem and also the availability of materials. And this is even without recognising that you know, we could all use less stuff. But there's a lot of people in the world who want to use just a little bit more stuff. And so we can't say uh, all the rest who haven't enjoyed everything that we've enjoyed in terms of what steel does in our lives, uh, they can do without it. So um, having said this, and trying to remember what my next question is. <laughs> That's okay, because I have, I have one small follow-up question to you on the former slides. Um, so the, that little bit of remaining emission from uh, hydrogen-based steelmaking, where, where is it coming from? From the electric arc furnace. And why is it still producing? Um, in the electric arc furnace, typically today, you put in seven different sources of carbon for various reasons. Some of them you can do without. You can probably get down to four different sources of carbon, but some of them you really can't do without, especially, for example, I mentioned nickel with its 12 tonnes to 60 tonnes per tonne of nickel. If you put that into some of the high-quality steels, then there's carbon going in, and that carbon going in is carbon coming out. Um, if you think about... Whenever you see um, a molten metal bath of something, there's some type of slag material on top of it. That slag material is really important. It needs to cover all of the steel, otherwise it starts to eat away at the, uh, the refractory, the, the container. And so if you have to replace the container every month instead of every two years, that's a real cost driver in terms of, uh, of pushing up costs. And there's other bits of carbon that need to go in. One of the, the, the ones that everybody will uh, recognise is the electrodes. You have carbon-based electrodes, which nobody's managed to make uh, non-fossil electrodes at the moment. But that's only, you know, that's four to seven kilos per, per tonne of steel. But that's still a point that doesn't mean you don't get to a net zero um, emissions. Okay, yeah, so you've convinced me. I think that's the, uh, that this is, uh, um, yeah, that it's basically unavo technically unavoidable to have some remaining carbon emission and you can't with, you know, sort of technical solutions avoid that. You, you already pointed, I think, to the, to the sort of the justice element of the whole climate uh, issue, eh? like can we, you know, uh, reduce consumption uh, and others can, can increase. But there's also justice considerations in just if you really go down to the project level around CCS um, um, and, and the policy level of CCS. And this is also, uh, I'm now going to present like a, a, a pretty done down version <laughs> of the, the diagram I showed earlier, it's also uh, you know, a system dynamics diagram, again, with uh, thanks to Vincent and, uh, and, and Floris. So if we need societal support for uh, CCS projects locally, and often society says, okay, we will support a transition, we will support also the implementation of, of CCS if it is done in a just way, in a fair way, and if there's trust in industry, if we trust that actually our neighboring industries are doing a responsible 
job and are not squandering uh, uh, public money. Now, industry uh, can uh, say, well, we will invest in, a, in, in CCS as a, as a business case, but we, we, um, we do that if that business case is there, obviously. And we can only get this business case to work if there's a level playing field with uh, other industrial uh, players. And of course here uh, government comes in to provide support to, uh, to industry to ha make this happen. So they develop, uh, government develops policies to help industry implement CCS. But government needs legitimacy for those policies. It needs public support, a public mandate to actually implement policies that help CCS forward uh, to industry. And here, here you see that everything depends on um, everything. So um, the business case of CCUS and the level playing field depends on the design of the policies by the public sector. The uh, public sector needs legitimacy, and for legitimacy, you need public support. Uh, industry uh, needs societal uh, trust and needs to operate in a, in a fair way, and only uh, can do that if they uh, if they make investment in a in a just way. They determine with their behavior how this is being uh, done. And so, what this graph um, tells us is that everything depends on everything. Nobody actually holds the single key <laughs> to societal trust in CCS, in government, in industry, to, uh, uh, to be implemented. And we run the risk of everybody looking at each other. Like People look at industry to provide that trust. Um, um, industry looks at government to provide policies, and, and government doesn't is, is not sure of the public mandate to implement this, and is, uh, is worried that, uh, that they will lose a public mandate if they go uh, too quickly or if they spend a lot of public money on the industry, uh, which is not seen as just by, uh, by, by, by people. So there's also two levels eh, of, of justice here. There's the local level. Communities f feel that they uh, uh, should not be disadvantaged more than other communities. Um, and at a higher level, um, the, uh, there's, there is resistance uh, against industry uh, receiving too many subsidies out of the public port, uh, purse and at the same time making big profits, basically. That is a, a clear uh, concern. So this is uh, like a, a feedback loop, a trap in a way that we are in. Um, and we really feel that, uh, first of all, if you want to understand what's happening, you need to... Uh, not think about this issue as a linear issue, like governments in takes an action and an industry response. It is more complex than that, and you need to understand the relations between different actors and different elements in this system. Um, and you know, it is more complicated than the, the diagram I just showed, but uh, it's just an illustration. You have to recognize that there's dynamics, there's mutually reinforcing uh, factors, uh, there's, uh, there's traps, there's feedback loops that are either limiting uh, change or, or can uh, keep things uh, as they are, uh, but they can also make things go faster. And as all these stakeholders, industry, policy, society, and, and many others depend on each other uh, and need to collaborate on this because there's not a single actor that ha holds the key to everything, we need trust. We need to trust each other, and that's why we are asking the question in this event um, whether, um, you know, we tend to think also in EU documents and EU policies that this is about technology and this is about uh, um, uh, money. Uh, but it's also, uh, we find that, that society is sort of, a societal trust is, the, is potentially the missing link. So thank you very much for your attention to our conversation. Hand it back to uh, Moises. Thank you very much to both of you for the very insightful uh, commentary on this topic. And now to continue with this, we have three uh, uh, discussions to this panel. And I'm gonna please ask for a round of applause to uh, Hannah Biro from Bellona, please. <laughs> She's an expert on uh, sustainable finance on CCS and focusing on uh, Central and Eastern Europe on the topic. We have a uh, Mark Alexander, please. Also a warm welcome to him. He's an active advisor to European Works Council 
and uh, also at the transition project of near start if i'm pronouncing it correctly and well he has a long uh, experience as a main representative at, at the council but also he's a representative of the acv a trade union which is the biggest trade union in belgium and our third discussant is a uh, Marianne Flores, she's a, please, a warm welcome for her as well. She's a PhD in, in chemical uh, engineering, Marianne, correct me if I'm mistaken, yeah, by the University of Hent, and she works at uh, Finocas, which works really closely with uh, ArcelorMittal, and she's in charge of evaluating technologies, mitigation technologies and industrial technologies in general. Uh, from the technical, economic, and economic point of view, so right on the, on the discussion that we just left, the technical, economic point of view. So I invite you to all of you to discuss and try to expand the technical and the economic uh, perspective. So if you please have a, 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 an, an urgent uh, a question or comment to break the ice, feel free, otherwise I'm gonna finger point. Eh? Thank you, please. Maybe I can start. Uh, so yeah, my name is Hannah Biro. I work for Bologna Europa. We are a, a, an environmental and climate NGO and I work in the area of CCS and sustainable finance and sustainable economics and so on. And uh, a little bit uh, also in um, the Central and Eastern European region, which I will want to talk about a little bit because I think the question of trust may be a little bit different and is a little bit different in that context. Um, so when it comes to societal trust as being the missing link, I see it as definitely one missing link, definitely one bottleneck um, that uh, would has a great potential from keeping CCS um, being developed or more like being developed at the pace that we need, um, but I really like how the paper um, talks about it in the context of societal readiness because um, us experts or people who work in this field, we already know that we need CCS. We were just shown in the previous uh, uh, presentation, even in steel where we can use uh, hydrogen as, as a key decarbonization tool, we still need CCS there, so we know it's necessary, um, but society is just not ready, and w why is that? Well, one of the reasons, because it's not a very well known uh, technology, not in Europe, um, it's unknown to the general public, and this can in itself create a distrust because people just fear the things that they don't know and I think we've seen this in many other uh, walks of life not just uh, in terms of technology so um, one of the things that we need to focus on is how can we create this trust um, even though I've, I find it as a really big challenge and the paper talks uh, about how this should come as a bottom-up up process rather than top-down, which I really agree with. But at the same time, we need this technology at scale in order to achieve the decarbonization we need in time. So I believe this needs to, this, these two processes need to happen at the same time, hand in hand. We need to do the economic and technological analysis, um, have uh, the technology have an understanding of the technology and whether we are able to deploy it at scale at the same time as reaching out to society and having this conversation and creating this trust and uh, and scientists need to need to address the fear uh, related to the technology um, storage leakage feasibility uh, questions around that and we need clear and consistent collaboration between the stakeholders and we need this communication towards society to be very transparent and clear and, um, and to explain 
the risks and how they will be managed, as well as the benefits also for a, a just transition reason that we saw in the in the previous presentation. So I will stop here because I don't want to take the entire speaking time, but yeah, thank you. Very well said, Hannah. So uh, what I got from you, uh, trust becomes a, a crucial element and from the stake of uh, Bellona providing sustainable finance, okay, I think we can start building up trust as one criteria to finance the transition or am I going to to, uh, am I going beyond? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but um, yes, I mean, without trust, you don't have support. And without support, we don't have the technology. So the question is, how can we create the trust at the same time as we're already deploying the technology? Because th we, we already have so many CCS projects online. Uh, having taken final investment decision, having received funding. So, and we need these projects. So it's not like we can put a full stop and create trust and then continue. So we need to see this in its complexity and f need to find a synergy, in my opinion. Thank you. So on the note of, uh, of trust, Mark Alexander, would you like to give some commentary? Also feel free to expand. Do not limit it, please, to, to trust. I will treat that point as well, but I would like to start uh, my uh, contribution um, with, let's say, the framework within which uh, every technology should work. And this is in relation to the strategic goal that is now put forward in the climate policy uh, worldwide by the Paris Agreement and by the European um, yeah, Union itself in the United States at this moment. Maybe in a year it will be different again. But um, which is a, a net zero uh, approach, which means if we reach in 2050 our goal or so called goal of uh, net zero emissions, that is what we need to do. And I think this is a too narrow and one-sided framework. And why is it so? Because um, there is a difference in what is, has been taken up in the Paris Agreement and in um, the policies of uh, Europe and the United States and other countries, and what the climate sciences are uh, already saying for more than a decade. So. The difference is that when you look into the reports of the IPCC, they're not talking about climate neutrality as a strategic goal. It is just one moment of transition towards another goal, which is a strategic one. This is, we should not go to net zero, but to net negative emissions. And net negative emissions, they mean that we need to uh, capture and recycle and keep in circular loops the carbon that is already emitted into the atmosphere and into the oceans and wean off very fast and very profoundly from fossil carbon. Because it is not a question to apply CCU or CCS on fossil carbon that is not yet emitted, but will be emitted if we s continue to use fossil resources. But the, the task that we all have, uh, and it is for industry, it is for land management, it is for energy production, it is for all sectors like that. All sectors have to contribute to, um, to capture um, an order of magnitude of hundreds of billions of tons of carbon out of the atmosphere and the oceans in order to reverse climate warming and ocean acidification. So this framework, is something different because if we do not start from that frame framework and sooner or later we will be confronted to do it anyway, then we would choose at this moment for technologies which seem to be a solution but will become quite quickly um, dead assets because they will not be suitable for the tasks that we really need to do. And so I think that what we see in different uh, industrial branches, uh, there are good evolutions in trying to 
um, wean off from fossil uh, carbon. Um, but if and there is carbon needed any, any, in any way, then this carbon should not come anymore from new fossil resources, but from the ones that already have been emitted as a waste. And so if we apply the ladder of Lansing onto this already emitted uh, carbon, then this means that we should um, treat it in such a way rather for reusing it than for storing it as a waste, because that's in confrontation with the circularity goals that is also part of European and other goals. So I know this, is, this message is double, because on one hand it is saying, if we really want to make a transition which is giving certainty, more certainty for us as humanity, but also as trade union men, uh, for the workers in uh, very important sectors like the steel, uh, non-ferrous sectors, other sectors uh, can be uh, mentioned as well, then we need to have real alternatives which are lasting for more than two and a half decades. Um, and what still needs to be said is as well that we see an evolution um, decade after decade that the moment of climate neutrality is coming from further in the future to nearer in the future. Remember that in uh, assessment report number five, there was more talk talked about climate neutral neutrality at around 2070, while in SR 1.5 and then I AR 6, it is said it is 2050 worldwide, which is leading to say that even in the developed countries, we need to go to climate neutrality well before 2050. So we don't have a lot of time to go to uh, net zero as a moment and to uh, start to go further with net negative emissions. And this framework is making yeah, another uh, framework for our tasks. So when we have asked to our direction to participate in thinking for an alternative, it is this kind of uh, IPCC sciences which has led us also to start formulating alternatives which are not stopping at climate neutrality, but are uh, making practical propositions uh, that the enterprise is going further than that and wants to develop um, an ambition and develop the techniques to go to a climate positive, I call it as such, a climate positive in place of a climate neutral uh, future. And that for, for that kind of technology, we also need trust because capturing carbon CC from the atmosphere in the oceans will be an enormous task. It's, we're talking about different hundreds of billions of tons that need to be captured and preferably reused in, a, in different ways, in the soil as humus, in forests as trees, in energy making while using biomethane and capturing the, the CO2 and reusing it then, keeping it in circular loops. Um, in industry like the steel factory, if carbon is still needed to some extent, lesser than now, but still needed, it should not be fossil carbon, but it should be recycled carbon out of the atmosphere and the oceans. And it's the same all around. So we will not go to a carbon poor society, we'll go to a carbon rich society, but on ba based on recycled carbon in place of uh, new carbon. And for this, I think we need to, uh, to uh, develop our thoughts and our practices to give trust to the people to come to that point that if we really want to make a future that is sustainable for longer than one and a half or two and a half decades, that we need to do this kind of uh, carbon uh, recycling and utilization. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. I collected many points and got my interest that uh, what well, trust came again, but also you mentioned the tremendous uh, cost of any technological implementation to decarbonize and the challenge of actually uh, capturing emissions from any uh, technological option. Uh, but Marianne, you evaluate 
technologies from the technical economic point of view, like if you could tell us a little bit from your experience of the evaluation experience on uh, mitigation technologies, like could you give us could you give us some notes on that, please? I have so many things that I want to say, but I don't know where to start. <laughs> so maybe a comment. I, I will go to the story from the steel industry point of view, but from the comment of the CO2 capture. You know, capture is emitted in industry and in more concentrated streams. So it's easier to capture that CO2 than if we will just emit it, which is the case, for example, when you use a car and you emit that CO2 in the air is very diluted. So to capture that CO2, it costs much more energy than from an industrial point of view. So I like the story to think about uh, circular carbon, but it's also important to understand how much energy you need for that and how much energy you need to make it a fuel again, if you would like to make a circular fuel. The thing is, um, we then need enormous amounts of energy that unfortunately are not available at the moment. And this energy also needs to be low carbon. The most famous low carbon energy sources are wind and solar, which are also dynamic. It's not like we press a button and we make low carbon energy. We need to readapt our processes to also work with this dynamic uh, production of energy. Okay, so being said that, <laughs> I'm gonna try to organize my thoughts now. Um, from the steel industry point of view, so we have three possibilities. We can, um, capture the CO2 that we produce. So that will be the CO2 capture. And then there are two options. We do something with that CO2 to make a chemical or a fuel, or we could store it. Or we could just rebuild the plant and work on first natural gas-based uh, steel making and then shifting to hydrogen whenever it's available. All these options require different investments. The, in the case where you will move to gas uh, production or gas-based production of steel, you need to reveal your whole plant. Basically, you can only keep the finishing part when you have the melted iron. That's a big investment. You could also think that, okay, I can keep running my blast furnaces and I just retrofit it with additional technologies like the ones that Paul showed in his slides. And then I have this very concentrated source of CO2. I capture from that one. And at first I can decide to do CCS because we do have an urgency to reduce our CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And the most energy efficient way to do it is doing CCS. But then of course there are additional questions to it because I capture my CO2, but then the CO2 storage providers require some specifications for that CO2. It has to be super clean, so I have additional steps of cleaning that add up and do not help my business case. Um, so, okay, we are st still in negotiation with that, so I will not speak so much on detail on that, but it's part of the challenge to align different industry, chemical industry, steel industry, to have a um, common backbone where we could transport CO2 to a storage area. We could say that as the energy becomes greener and more available, because if we will do CCS with um, energy, for example, if you will do a project in Germany, you will actually emit more CO2. So the fact that you do a CCU doesn't always mean that you are having a low carbon product. So it's also important to consider what, sh what is the source of that energy that I'm using. I feel I'm saying so many <laughs> negative points, but <laughs> I guess that's the point of the discussion. Uh, so first thing that we should do is find low carbon energy. I think that should be the first thing that we do to then start making decisions. Um, then for the, so what did I say already? The gas-based steel, then the capture, and then when we have a lot of energy, we can think on, let's convert this CO2 to something else. So I don't know if you, if I answered no, very, very complete, question. Uh, very complete answer. Helene, I see that you are putting your microphone on. Would you like to react or someone of you would, would you like to react on the uh, on the commentary from the panelists? Also, uh, to the public, feel free to jump with any question. If you want to, if you want to interrupt, please just uh, raise your hand and we can also play some of the questions to the panelists. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't need to. Of course, this raises lots of <laughs> lots of associations. But one, I think there's one thing that we really need to make clear, and that's the distinction between CCS, CCU, and CO2 removal. Right. So CCS on fossil fuel does not r reduce the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Right. It 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 means that the concentration doesn't increase. Right. But it's not C it's not c carbon dioxide removal. If you do CCU, as you say, uh, Marianne, very, uh, very truly, you need uh, low carbon energy to, to do it. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but also, if you want that to be really net, net zero, you, uh, um, you need to have a, a permanent storage, a permanent use of your CO2, so not fuels that will immediately emit the CO2 again. Or you need to get your CO2, your carbon, from a non-fossil source. Right, either or, and you cannot be uh, net zero without that. Um, if you want to be net negative, you need all three. That's actually work by Kiana here uh, uh, to figure that out. Um, so yeah, so the I think CCU is basically only a good idea, especially if you want to go negative. If you uh, basically get get rid of fossil fuels in all your in all your processes somewhere. So that the, I think the core question is how do we combine, on the one hand, the implementation of everything we've been talking about with um, um, yeah, phasing out fossil fuels on the, the feedstock side uh, of industry as, as much as possible. And I was really curious to hear from you guys and maybe also from people in the room where we are with that because we, we need all strategies at the same time uh, if we want to keep a, you know, Climate compatible and competitive industry in, uh, uh, in in Europe, and then the next part, of course, is is is, is the is society uh, sufficiently uh, on board on this, uh, and is the public sector also aware of the of the urgency of uh, of all these strategies implemented at the same time? May I? Oh. Um. The important thing for us, as uh, for me as trade union man, I'm now in pension, but I'm advisor still for the European Works Council of Nieuwstar, um, is uh, to find a way that prevents um, enterprises to do apparently good investments that after quite a short time appear to be not sufficient. Because if you do that, then you have to invest twice. You invest once in a half a measure, in a half measure, seeing that this is not responding anymore at a given time, and that moment will come ever sooner. Being confronted that it is not enough, you need to invest again in the end solution, or in a better solution. This is what was happening with Tata Steel in Amadon. <coughs> they had decided to do a CO2 reduction investment, which could result in up to 50% reduction of CO2, which was a billion investment on its own, and would not be sufficient anyway. And that is why, at that moment, both trade unions and environmental organizations were scared and also a bit angry because they said, gosh, if you're going to do that, then we're going to be uh, phased out by other steel factories who will go to, in one step, to the good, to a better technology, which is really leading to at least zero and as I try to plead for, is even negative emissions. <coughs> so why is that important for all of us? It's important for the enterprise to, for a lasting uh, um, existence of the enterprise. It is important for the workers who are there. They are not happy. They are not keen to see investments come that do not guarantee the future, because it doesn't guarantee their future either. So. That's why we ask to our direction to be implied right onwards from the beginning with consultation, with discussion. In Tata, it happened in another way. Eh? They first 
came with restructuring and there was a big, a big uh, strike and battle, <laughs> 24, 22 days. And after that, there was an agreement for strategic cooperation and a, a shift in strategy. Well, if we do that in a proactive way, in a preventive way, rather than in a reactive way, we will go faster than when we do it uh, in, a, in a step by step approach. So I really, my, my, uh, my point to all of you, especially to those who are responsible for enterprises, don't take, don't be happy with half measures. You will be soon confronted that they are not enough and you will have to invest again. And you will see that quite a lot of billions will be lost. So that's what I, I want to uh, interrupt now. Thank you very much. Any reaction from the public? Otherwise, uh, I see that Paul is uh, already putting the microphone on. It's on now. Okay. Um, I don't actually know of any of the major steel companies who are um, talking about uh, a, a net zero or a real net zero solution, talking about net zero solutions, but not actually providing um, any flow sheets showing how they're going to do it in a technically um, believable way. Um, but what I would say is that typically, if you're looking at investments, you're, you, in, even in new plants, you've got um, a 20-year timeline today in terms of you're going to put something down, it's going to run for 20 years, and then after it, you're going to try and make it sure it runs another 20 years or put down something new. So, um, of course, that doesn't feed into your wish and my wish as well to have this accelerated um, transition, but that's part of the way the tax system is based in uh, in many uh, in many countries in terms of what you can uh, put on your bottom line as being an investment or not. Um, I think what's um, I'd like to bring this back to to see for you because one of the primary ideas within C for you from a technical point of view was. Okay, we've got a steel plant, one single integrated steel plant, and we could identify six major sources of CO2 on that plant. We tried before one technology to capture all that CO2. Not going to happen. So within c for u instead of looking for six different technologies for six different approaches, we looked for two approaches to... Um, group and reorganize the steel plant in such a way that we could capture as much as possible. Um, so I wouldn't say that this thinking of trying to, um, uh, trying to not make a decision today that you're going to regret in 10 years time or 15 years time, that's definitely part of our thinking within the C4U project, which is where we got to this, although at the time we weren't thinking about how do we go to this climate positive um, uh, wish that you have, and that I do as well, and I, I do have some ideas about how that's going to do, and that's in projects that are further down the line. Um, but I'd, I'd, I don't think it's realistic to to assume uh, an investment strategy out beyond 20 years in terms of uh, what you're going to do. Technology is going to be replaced. Technology gets replaced all the time. Sometimes you've got uh, a unit there for five years before it becomes not the best thing that you could have done in terms of your whole business strategy. So you, uh, so you change. Um, Any reaction on that? Please. No? Yes. Okay, so I, I wanted to react a little bit 
to the negative emissions aspect of this, the carbon dioxide removal aspect. I kind of look, I, and I think everyone should look at it this way, as in an exam, you have an exam, there's a deadline to that exam. Every day you spend procrastinating, the deadline of, for the exam comes a day closer, which kind of leads to it that our priority needs to be reduction first and then removals. Um, and which is why I think CCS needs to be prioritized over CCU as well. Because with CCU, you cannot in every case, and I would say in most cases, you cannot uh, guarantee permanence. So you need to look at the solutions in which first you reduce your uh, emissions, and then of course, once we reach the net zero, you remove. And CCS makes sense in the areas where you cannot otherwise uh, reduce. So of course, we're not talking about fossil fuels, and I think this was also mentioned in the paper that the way to create trust is to make sure that CCS is not a tool and is not seen as a tool to um, extend the fossil fuel age. And this is why I think we desperately, desperately need to get some CCS projects over the finish line and be able to thereby show up, show for successful, successful CCS projects as positive examples of climate change mitigation for industry, for hard to abate industries. So we can move on from it being a concept, a theoretical concept that we think works, or a technology that works in a fossil fuel context to a real climate change mitigation solution. That is just one part of the puzzle. I, I don't want to say that it is the most important, but it is very important. Why? Because it has the potential to save our industries, to keep our industries in business that are providing thousands and thousands of jobs, not just within that industry, but up and down the value chain as well, and uh, the building materials for a renewable, um, renewable solutions for a renewable infrastructure. So it has multiple roles. That's what I wanted to say. I agree with what Hannah says. I think also we should remember that we have a carbon budget, and this it's uh, the amount of CO2 that we can emit to prevent reaching the increase in the global temperature. And the more we wait to start doing something, the more difficult it will be to prevent, to not surpass this budget. And the fact that CCS could play an important role in this just because we can sooner than waiting for the low carbon energy start removing CO2, I agree it's not negative because we just prevent it to accumulate in the environment. But we also need steel, and I go back to the steel because I work for a steel industry. <laughs> we need a lot of steel also to decarbonize the rest of the world. So we should at least um, think that, <laughs> what? <laughs> now you're jumping on the chair. <laughs> We should think that if we really, we, should, we need to start doing things now and if we can keep running um, the steel industry as it is now and just add this additional part to capture CO2 and we can already avoid those additional CO2, that's something. The plants that decide to go to direct reduction of iron, so the gas phase uh, process, they also will have to start with natural gas because we just don't have the low carbon hydrogen. And they will also have to capture CO2 and if we really want to have a me an impact, because otherwise the reduction is not really that much, if we don't capture that CO2 from the direct reduction plants, we will still be emitting CO2. Please? Yeah, could you please uh, introduce yourself and uh, send your question, please? 
Thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Thierry Bernier, so I'm working for CO2 Value Europe, uh, where the association representing CCU. Um, there's been already a lot of uh, discussion on CCU, so I'm not going to ask a question just about that. So I just wanted to say uh, thanks for the, for the good discussion. I think it was uh, very, very interesting. My question for the panel, and it's relevant both for the, for the CCS part and for the CCU part, is that we heard about um, carbon capture not being uh, used as a, as, a, as a way to prolong the, the fossil fuel era and so on. Um, do you think that it's a good idea to um, start to differentiate between, for example, unavoidable carbon from steel making? So we heard from the presentation that you have part of the primary steel production which will create like unavoidable uh, um, carbon. Is it a good idea to start to differentiate that part with um, fossil emissions, for example, from uh, fossil fuel? So let's say from a, a gas-fired power, power plant. Is it a good idea to go in that direction. I start to hear, for example, in the cement industry or in other industries, uh, people talking about geogenic CO2 to make like a distinction between that CO2 and the CO2 from fossil fuel, or is it going to create like other issues in your view and it's not really the way forward? I would just be keen to, uh, to hear what you think about this. Thank you very much for your question. Who will you, uh, would you like to jump in into that question, Paul, Marianne, or maybe you, Helene? I can do. Um, I think that um, th th there are some unavoidable emissions in steel making today, but there's not that many. The, the, the point I was trying to make was not that, um, uh, that, that CCS is not, is not gonna help us um, or that hydrogen is not gonna help us. Of course, it's gonna help us. It's just it moves the CO2 um, uh, technology uh, goal from CCS from primary steel making today to CCS across the electric arc furnace, which which has a different profile. It's got different. Uh, it's it's basically much more. It's dirtier. It's dustier. It's diluter. It's um, uh, more dynamic and it's more uh, discontinuous, which are all things that chemical engineers hate to hear. So it just makes it much more difficult to capture the CO2 in those cases. But it's not impossible. It just needs to mean that the, it means that the shift in focus on technology has to move to this type of um, 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 approach, which goes to Mark's point of making an investment today that you're going to throw away in uh, 20 years' time. I'd say make the investment today, that's going to create a lot of jobs, and make the investment in 20 years' time as well when you get to the electric arc furnace, which will also create a lot of jobs, which I think is good for, uh, for us. <laughs> um, but in terms of trying to differentiate, the second part was differentiate between the different types of CO2. I think um, we were having a discussion earlier today in terms of um, Bex and uh, so bioenergy CCS. How do you valorize that, or how do you valorize for a company to use carbon that's been recycled as opposed to um, carbon that's taken out of a process or carbon that's taken out of the a ground? How do you set up the rules to be able to do that? And in my head, I don't know how you do that. So I think if you if you start to um, uh, to make it easier to do uh, BEX and CCUS, you automatically start to make it easier and more financially uh, viable to do CCS as well. I think <clears throat> the most important uh, <clears throat> difference should be, is it new carbon that is going to be captured or is it old carbon that's going to be captured? New carbon is one that is still in the oil drill or in the gas well. Old carbon is the one that already have been emitted during two uh, centuries of industrial activity and have been adding around, I think, 300 billion tons of supplementary CO2 in the atmosphere and even hundreds of billions of tons more in the oceans. So that distinction is for me essential because the one thing 
is only stabilizing. The other thing is lessening. And this is really strategically very important. And I would love, for example, it's just one example, because there are more examples than that one. But I would love that industries would investigate not searching only for uh, carbon poor or carbon zero, but for climate positive energy. That will bring us much quicker to the point of zero emissions and to the point of coming to um, net negative emissions. So I don't think, I do not agree to say we should do one step after the other. We have no time for that. When I read the reports from the IPCC, I see that the deadline for net zero is ever coming closer to us. And even their starting point is one and a half degrees. I want to mention that there are also fora in the world who are demanding to go lower than one and a half degrees. So if we would do that, and what I think we should do that, then the point of 2050, 40, is in the past. <laughs> so we do not have the time to say, well, let's first do this and then do that. We need massive investments in the right thing, which are, is doing two things at the same time, which is weaning off new carbon, fossil carbon, and lessening the carbon that is already present in the atmosphere and in the oceans, and that we need to do both movements simultaneously. This will be also one of the core points of our proposition to our direction, not do step after step, but do it simultaneously. And I know this, mean, this can mean an enormous amount of investment, but if I see what would have happened with Tata Steel when they had done step after step, the amount of investments are higher. So it's better to do the right thing or the two right things simultaneously at a higher amount than just doing one thing, being confronted to doing both anyway later on and to having to do that investment anyway both of them. So for our future, our common future of the planet, but also for our industries, for our working places, it is important, according to me, to do both now. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very tempted to respond to the more technical question, but I'm trying to um, think from what what is the approach that increases societal trust, right? How would society view your your question um, and one debate that comes to mind is is around what are what are actually unavoidable emissions right I mean uh, we had a discussion on hard to abate sectors um, a couple of years ago you know steel was basically hard to abate it was sort of seen as okay you need CCS because you cannot reduce the emissions in any other way and now we're down to only a little bit of the emissions that need CCS and so this this sort of concept of what is hard to abate has, you know, if you really, um, um, of course, there's emissions in the agricultural sector that are hard to abate. Yeah, only if you keep your meat and dairy consumption on current levels, then it's hard to abate. If you would actually reduce that significantly, it's actually not that hard to abate. You've ha you have abated it, but it's more on the demand side. So what is hard to abate? Um, what is the demand that we really cannot do uh, um, without? And you get into <coughs> into that discussion very quickly, uh, and then it doesn't become a technical question anymore, but it becomes a, a broader um, question and, and 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 much harder uh, to answer, uh, or at least you need you know societal input <laughs> and the political process to uh, to answer this um, in in a way. So that would be sort of my reflection on on your question that that is a factor as well, that, that it's uh, often framed as a technical question, but actually it, 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 it can be much more than that, and we maybe uh, are able to do more on the societal uh, um, f um, area in order to make this, uh, what is actually hard to abate, and a less urgent a question, or make that question smaller in a way. Um, yeah, that was just a bit of an addition. Thank you very much, Helene. Uh, 
for the next part, like we have been talking about system dynamics in the, in the previous presentations. We have been talking about society, uh, policy, and business having uh, interconnected relations on the adoption of CCS and CCU. And here in the panel, we have discussed about, let's put it in this way, a social license. We have been talking about uh, the very different forms of carbon capture that we as society narrow it down to two forms, CCS and CCU. And we have also talked about energy prices, uh, the techno-economic evaluations. So how about we try to create a, a narrative like using these panelists with different, different expertise they hold, and also please with the engagement of, of, of the audience, to create that narrative that supports adoption of technology to decarbonize the industry, including the societal license, the business needs, technological needs, and the current policy uh, landscape. Would someone from the audience like to start with the discussion, or would you like to start, Helene, or any from the panel? Maybe you want to start, because I'm not sure if I understand your question completely. Okay, no, pretty nice. Uh, yeah, I got very, I, I, I'm really attracted to the, to the diagram as you presented. Um, and I really see the close depend interdependencies between different systems. And from my stake, uh, societal, societal license, I'm really, I'm very, uh, I'm a promoter of having society engaged into these discussions, uh, making clear for them that CCS is not gonna run the risk of being applied to expand oil and gas industries. And I think many people from NGOs and trade unions or unions in general can relate to these citizens as well. And how does that legitimize the policies we need? The policy instruments with that we need to support the adoption of CC, CCS or CCU. So my question goes into that direction. Like we have been uh, uh, talking about our concerns, concerns representing our different stakes. So how can we build on that? So we mentioned that there is a high economic prices on uh, technology adoption, that there's high uh, prices on, on, on energy, but also there's concerns on society and also there's uh, technological considerations to make. So any insights on that? So I, I think what you're, what you, I was triggered by that you said, okay, we need to take this societal perspective. So I think maybe what we should stop doing is, is treat industry and society and government as sort of separate, completely separated entities. Society is, is to be part of this industrial transition rather than uh, sort of something that's is basically by industry, correct me if I'm wrong, seen as a nuisance, right? I mean, you know, for new technologies, you need to do uh, a consultation or information, then you might actually get comments and that might, slo might slow things down. That's sort of how you know, societal um, uh, yeah, consultation processes are often seen. So they slow things down, they cost a lot of money, um, uh, and, and in the end, what you're trying to do, just do is, you know, get acceptance from people in order, uh, and that's why you, uh, you try to tick the boxes in the law um, for, for societal engagement, and that's it. But industry is not is seeing society as something external and as a nuisance. It's, yeah. And so I think if, if industry would, would sort of embrace society in a way more and make them yeah, like you're doing this for society, right? And not just for the, uh, maybe not just for the profits, even though that's that, that will in our current system always be the main driver, but the, um, but embrace society more and make it more part of your, uh, and realize that you're part of society. Maybe that's, that's a different narrative that, that goes a, a bit along what you, now we start constructing mean? on that narrative. So, uh, Mariana, I, I saw that you are putting the microphone on and yeah. you evaluate techno-economic and that we have the social. Yeah, this um, I'm not very expert on the social part, so everything that we discuss here is very interesting for me. Um, I think the word nouns is very strong, maybe. We also need to interact with society because we make steel products, so 
our sales department needs to talk to the people that purchase our products and understand what the, are the market needs and how can we produce the products that they are interested in buying. But then, um, let's say if they will have an innovation, it's always difficult to know, will this be uh, accepted and will I do an investment that will be not rejected by society? But for us, from the company perspective, it's very difficult to cover all these aspects. And I think, and this is in my very personal opinion, because normally I'm not the person involved in this kind of discussions, that's where we also uh, lean on the government to help, so policymakers to help also on the societal aspect. For us, it's very we will be like an octopus trying to cover all the different aspects. And actually, are these spaces that allow us also to understand, well, also me personally, <laughs> What are the, the other point of view outside from our company bubble that is not a bubble anymore? Because now we also participate in regional uh, groups that are evaluating projects, not only from the steel point of view, but evaluating symbiosis between other industries, like the one you showed in the North Sea Port uh, initiatives. Thank you very much. Hannah. I think maybe you touched upon a very key issue there that um, industries are there to produce a good and make profit in return and that we rely on institutions, our public institutions, to keep them in check in return, uh, not for profit. <laughs> and, um, and this is why trust in institutions is so important because you cannot necessarily trust industries to do what's best for the people because they work for profit, but you can trust your elected officials to do what's best for you. This is how it should be at least. But due to corruption and other things, many things play into this. Um, maybe that trust is also broken. So we need to ask ourselves, like, how can we rebuild this trust? What are the institutions that we can trust? Because in that case, this needs to be initiated from that institutions. I can say for many countries, or at least for my country, from the Central and Eastern European regions, we have very, very low trust in our institutions because of corruptions and because of a lot of historical baggage that we haven't been able to sort out. But the one institutions that we do trust, uh, tend to trust, is the EU. So I think it, it would make sense to have um, sort of a, a general um, information coming from that level of government from the European Union on CCS. What are the plans with CCS? Why do we need it? Where do we need it? To what extent do we need it? And, and this is something we could build upon. And now this is also related to something that you said earlier, which is that that we know it's not to extend the fossil fuel age. And sadly, I don't think that we know that. I think there is a very legitimate concern that we haven't yet disproved that it's not going to happen or that we can be confident at least it's not going to be taken advantage now, now that we need it in more uh, on in more urgent applications like the harder to abate industry. And it is it would be very important, a very important message to be coming from the EU. Um, there are some countries uh, in uh, the Scandinavia, Nordic countries, I think maybe also the Netherlands who have signed this Alborg declaration to say this is not to extend the fossil fuel age, but then at the EU level, I don't know, those of you have, who have seen the leak of the industrial carbon management strategy, there is a target for CCS applied on fossil fuels. I find that very concerning, and I sincerely hope that that's going to change on the 6th of February when it comes out. We, don't, we do not need a target on CCS for fossil fuels, and especially not coming from the EU. If we're gonna have CCS on fossil fuels, that needs to be out of sheer desperation uh, in the future 
not in the close future. So just wanted to add that. Anna, if we could put uh, your comments into a key message, something that we can, it's very challenging, I know, and no pressure, but uh, if we could put that into one, two, preferably one key message, take away for all of us, for the audience, what would that be? And don't worry, the, the rest of the panelists are gonna also go through the same challenge, yeah? Uh, that is very difficult to do. Um, I, th I think m my key me message would be, do not underestimate the power of social acceptance, of the social license, and we have already so much uh, information and data on what is needed to create that trust, and we need to get going. And one of these things, for example, is so many of these things, I think five or six are listed in this paper, for example, and maybe I would like to add one uh, that, that I didn't read there, and I think that is um, the urgency related to the climate crisis, the climate crisis being treated as a crisis because that is the reason why we, we need CCS. That's, that's the reason why we're stuck with this widely expensive, very inconvenient technology. Because if we had more time, maybe we, we could have better solutions, better innovations. But we need to treat the climate crisis as the crisis that it is because that gives legitimacy to this technology. And in some countries where there is an understanding about the urgency, like Denmark, we need that they're moving very fast. And in countries where it's still treated as one of our issues, there things move slower. So, sorry, it wasn't one sentence, but... It wasn't one sentence, but it was very insightful. So, urgency uh, of the climate crisis. Mark, would you like to give... I, th I think two, message, two, if I may, which is uh, the first one being more on the technical level, we need to move fast, which means, uh, according to me, that we have to do both the mitigation, which means weaning off fossils, and at the same time, taking out carbon out of the atmosphere and the oceans, which is an urgent matter to do. This is one thing, and the technologies need to be invented or adapted for doing this here. The second thing is, this should happen in a social just way. If we have the, the concern that it should um, yeah, have support from the people, I know out of my point of view how hard it is to hear that people need to pay more and more for this and this and this, and at the same time they hear that there is a f completely freedom for very high dividends and very high profit rates, which are increasing, not for all, but on societal level they are. This is not giving the feeling that it is just, and I think that there must come also European legislation, which is mastering the market, mastering the market, and, and obliging to put priorities, not allowing to say, I only do an investment that gives a return after six months, not only investments that give a return of 15 or 20 percent, but to collect the funds for investment for the transition that is needed, and that this should be also come out of European legislation. Thank you. So I can I can collect from from that a, a perception of justness between the different actors involved. Is that right? Yeah, that's the second one. Yeah, the second one, sorry. <laughs> and first one was both mitigation and mitigation. Um, negative emissions. And negative emissions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Marianne, if you could uh, send a key message, final remark to the audience and to the rest of the panelists, please. Yes. Um, so the main message is we need uh, low carbon hydrogen slash electricity as soon as we can. That should be the first priority. And then if we don't have that available, CCS should not be seen as an enemy to reduce CO2 emissions fast while all these windmills and PV panels are installed. And in the case of CCS, uh, we also need some help on these um, specifications of the CO2 because a lot of discussion is going on on that. 
to be able to execute the projects. Thank you very much. Elaine, if you would like to give some notes, final final key message yeah, on your so side. Yeah, my, so my final key message would really be take the social license, take legitimacy, take a societal trust seriously and see it as something that that is, um, yeah, that is actually good to have. And this goes for both governments, but, but especially for, uh, for industry uh, as well. I really think it's a neglected uh, point that needs much more attention also in the carbon management strategy um, and in, in legislation, because I fear, I mean, we can call on industry to do it, uh, but they won't unless it's uh, in law somehow <laughs> that they have to do it. So to take the social license and legitimization of the support policy of serious. So if I reframe correctly. Paul, last but not least, what will be your key message? Maybe the least. Um, being as this is, is talking about trust, and uh, I think two aspects of trust have come up. One, trust in governments to do the right thing, to promote the right type of um, uh, uh, approach. Also, trust from trust in industries to do what they're supposed to do in order to reach uh, uh, the goals that we set down to them. Um, but then I wanted to make a personal trust issue for me is that, and maybe this is also important, is that if you come with an idea of how you're going to get to net zero or this positive um, climate uh, wish, then you have to really come with ideas that actually work and I don't see those ideas being generated or being asked for by governments come with these climate positive um, um, uh, solutions and if the governments are not asking for these climate positive solutions then the researchers aren't going to delve into it and one of the reasons they might not be delving into it by themselves at the moment is because they don't see a way of how do we divide all the biomass how do we get the energy required to do all this recycling of carbon from the atmosphere so there's trust on multiple levels that needs to be um, achieved in order to to get to this better than a net zero uh, future world it's not that i think we can't do it it's just that somebody has to focus on that and make sure that we c are enabled to do it. So we expanded on the on the portfolio of, of, of different forms of, of trust. So what I can get uh, from you and some I ideas need to be generated to arrive to positive climate solutions and questions like where do we get, how do we get the energy, how do we divide, divide the biomass are questions that still need uh, attention uh, initially from researchers but also from society at whites and well, how about uh, well, we, s we continue discussing these these points uh, uh, further in the program i would like to thank all the panelists here for your valuable contributions or also for coming all the way uh, to brussels or for just coming to seps and i will uh, We'll continue with the. We will continue with the program. So, Irina, please, the floor is yours. Oh well, thank you, Moises. I think uh, we are perfectly on time because we started uh, five minutes later. So, I will not take a lot of your time. Uh, I was fascinated by this discussion uh, to map the dynamics between society, industry and government relations. And I'm also pleased to hear that a lot of attention and a lot of trust is given to the European Union and to European policy making. And I think it's a nice... Uh, uh, well, it's a nice sign, especially when we are waiting for the upcoming strategy and our next meeting, I guess, will be to discuss what are the next steps and what we will see in 
this strategy. So I would like to thank everyone who joined us today and uh, I wish you a nice day. Thank you.